the tomato. What exactly is it? Is it a fruit? Is it a vegetable? We kind of joke about that kind of a question nowadays, but that joke was not always so funny. Back in 1893, the debate over whether or not the tomato is a fruit or a vegetable went all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States. And it took Justice Horace Gray to finally come down with the decision, the final definitive answer, is that a fruit or is that a vegetable? Now, to understand how he came about it, we need to understand a little bit about the definitions for fruits and vegetables. That's what this video is about. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to define what's a fruit and what's a vegetable. Biologically speaking, a fruit is the product of a pollinated flower that contains the seeds necessary to propagate the next generation of plant. A vegetable then would be the parts of a plant that aren't that. So roots, stems, leaves, and flowers. Those would be examples of vegetables. But that's biologically speaking. If you go down to the grocery store, you will find that speaking in terms of culinary, the culinary arts, you will find that fruits and vegetables have a different definition. Fruits tend to be brightly colored and very sweet, where vegetables tend to be mostly green or yellow and not so sweet. But even those lines are kind of blurry. We're gonna go with the biologic definition. Now, there's more than one type of fruit, just like there's more than one type of flower. So let's look at some of the different types of fruits so that you can maybe get a better grasp of what that tomato actually is. Fruits can be divided basically into two major groups. You have the dry fruits and you have the fleshy fruits. Of the dry fruits, those can further be subdivided into those that will pop open upon maturity and those that don't pop open upon maturity. The words for those in biology are the dehiscent and indehiscent. Dehiscent means to open upon maturity. Now, of the dehiscent fruits, there are three types. We have those, imagine a dehiscent fruit being things that form inside of a pod, okay? If that pod opens on one side, you have a follicle. If it opens on two sides, two seams, you have a legume, and three seams, you have a capsule. So for instance, follicles. Uh, a magnolia is an example of a follicle. Uh, but this is an aggregate follicle. Each of these little individual sections right here of this magnolia pod, each of those individual sections, those are each its own follicle, but it forms from one flower, thus making it what's called an aggregate. Another common one is the cattail. Cattails, this is actually the flower of a cattail, and when it gets pollinated, it begins to produce these seeds. The fluff actually helps to carry it dispersed by wind, but the individual seeds themselves are little tiny minuscule follicles. So those are examples of follicles. To split on two sides, you can imagine a green bean, a sugar snap pea, or a, a peanut. These are legumes. Other examples of legumes, uh, they would look like this. Here's a pod that you can see there's a seam right here. Flip it over and there's a seam on that side. This would split along two seams. Here's a whole cluster of pods and you can see here's an individual one and you can see how it splits right down along those two seams. Still has lots of seeds in it. So these are examples of legumes. A capsule is one that has a little bit more complexity. It's gonna split on more than one side. So you can see, or more, along more than one seam. So you can see this one splits along five seams. Uh, so this is an example of a capsule right here. Uh, other ones, such as even the common sweet gum. Whoops, let's try it again. The common sweet gum. Sweet gum is an example of an aggregate capsule. So there's more than one capsule that is there. So these are the uh, dry fruits that split and open up to disperse their seeds when those fruits are mature. The other group of dry fruits are the indehiscent fruits. These are the ones that don't split open upon maturity. One example of those, there are four different types. First one is a nut. 
Uh, now, don't be careful. Peanuts are legumes. Cashews and almonds are actually different kind of nuts. Uh, they're actually the core of a stone fruit, which is one of the fleshy fruits. We'll get to that one in a second. But uh, pecans, walnuts, these are examples of, um, of the nuts, a true nut. Also, an acorn. Uh, acorns are examples of true nuts. They do not split upon maturity. Um, and uh, hickories. You can see these hickory nuts right here. Hickory are examples of uh, dehiscent fruits. There that. Now what, what defines a nut is that you have the seed on the inside, but the ovary wall that protects the seed is very hard and woody. Think about the shell of a pecan versus the meat, which is on the inside. The meat is actually the seed part. So there's also a type of seed called the coreopsis. Uh, or the caryopsis. A caryopsis is a grain. So if you imagine any kind of wheat or rye or any of the grass seeds, you can even see on some of these grass seeds, if you look close, you can see some of the small white seeds that are still on the edge of that particular stalk. So this is a caryopsis. Um, the caryopsis, corn is another example of this. In a caryopsis, the seed and the ovary wall are fused together. This is why with grains, you have to lay them out on the ground and you have to beat them and pound them and break them all apart. And then you have to throw all that material into the air so that the wind can blow the chaff away, leaving the grain behind in the process called threshing. That's how you can separate the grain from the ovary wall that surrounds them. Then you have another type of seed called a samara. In a Samara, you have the seed itself, like this one right here on the edge, and then the ovary actually forms a wing-like structure right here that helps these seeds to helicopter to the ground. Inside of pine trees, inside of pines like this one, you can see I'm dropping out, There's, there goes a few, um, the pine tree, even though it's not a flowering plant, its seed takes the form of a Samara. The last dry seed um, is the akin. An example of an akin is a sunflower seed. You can see the akin right here. In this one, if you've ever eaten sunflower seeds, you know you can crack the shell away and the seed is on the inside, but it's loose on the inside. It's not attached. So the seed is not attached to the hard ovary wall. And that's an example of an akin. Interestingly enough, the strawberry plant, the strawberry, actually is a pseudocarp. It's a fruit, but a different way because the fleshy part on the outside is actually, or on the inside, is actually not, well, it's still the fruit, but the actual seed part itself are the little dots on the outside, and those are actually very similar to akins, but they're attached to a fleshy fruit. And those are the dry fruits, three types of indehiscent or three types of dehiscent and four types of indehiscent. Now, what about the fleshy fruits? The fleshy fruits themselves can actually be divided into two major groups. You have those that are single fruits and you have those that are a grouping of fruits. And I don't mean a cluster like a bunch of grapes. Those are individual fruits. I mean things like a raspberry. A raspberry is actually individual fruits, but they're all fused together because they all come from a single flower. So one raspberry comes from a single flower, but it's multiple fruits that are stuck together. So this is an example of an aggregate. Uh, the raspberries, blackberries are aggregates. Um, I already talked about with some of the dry fruits, things like the magnolia, which is an aggregate of follicles, and the sweet gum, which is an aggregate of capsules. So this is an aggregate fruit. It comes from one flower. Then you have what are called the multiple fruits. Multiple fruits are where you have one fruit, but it's fused, all, that fruit is fused from multiple flowers. So for example, the pineapple. 
I got you on that one, didn't I? Believe it or not, this will actually used to be a pineapple. Pretty much anything. Back in the Middle Ages, if it was growing on a tree and it produced seeds, the common term for it was apple. Uh, for, instance, um, uh, for instance, the pomegranate. From the Latin, we get the word pomegranate from the Latin words that mean apple with lots and lots of seeds on the inside. So, so apple was a very common term, but it wasn't until 1624 that Captain John Smith actually called this the pineapple. I think because it resembled that, but I guess they didn't want to get these things confused. So when they realized that this really wasn't a flowering plant, it was a conifer, they changed this to pine cone, no longer a fruit. And this kept the name pineapple, even though it has nothing to do with apples and nothing to do with pines. But this is a multiple fruit. What that means is that every single one of these individual little scale looking things is actually came from its own flower. And they all fuse together to create this as a pineapple. So this is an example of a multiple fruit. So now when it comes to the fleshy fruits that are single, there's actually five different types of those. The first one are known as Hesperidia, or in singular, a Hesperidium. Those would be the citrus ones. What characterizes the Hesperidia is that these, when you open them up, the, uh, the, the ovary walls, let me get that open, the ovary walls are connected to the actual fruit by kind of that white that really white colored interior, all the white stuff, uh, the skin tends to peel off of the inside very easily. And then of course the seeds are on the inside. So that is a Hesperidium, it includes all of the citrus. Then we have what are called the stone fruits. Stone fruits have that hard, hard, stony, um, literally the ovary wall is very woody and rock-like on the inside. The seed then is on the inside. Interestingly enough, a cashew is a stone fruit. It's the seed, you have to get rid of the fleshy part, get rid of the stone part, and then you have the actual seed itself, and they are delicious. That's an example of a stone fruit. Other examples, hmm, this is really good. Other examples, of course, that you might be familiar with is the peach, which by the way, used to be known as the Persian apple. There we go again. So the peach is a stone fruit, or cherries. Uh, here's an example of a wild cherry. Let me get my pocket knife out. So, these are examples of wild cherries. Not really good to eat. This comes from an ornamental tree, uh, so it's not really that good to eat. But if I open this up, if I take the time to open this and split it open like that, you can see on the inside, there is that stone. On the inside of that is the seed itself. So these are examples, so cherries are examples of stone fruits. Um, another one that you might be recognized is the poem, P-O-M-E. Poem is an apple, a pear. These are characterized by having the seeds, only a few seeds on the inside, but they're surrounded by a light, a uh, very thin, leathery kind of a capsule. They're fleshy all the way out to the skin. The skin tends to be very smooth and very thin. So those are examples of uh, a poem, apples, pears. Then you can have what are called the peepos. Peepo is known as a false berry. It's not a true berry. They tend to have lots of seeds, but they are congregated way deep in the center of the fruit. And then you have a fleshy to the outside and the outside tends to be thicker, like a rind. So if you imagine a cantaloupe, a watermelon, or a cucumber. Cucumbers, these are examples of peepos. These are false berries. And that leads us to the last group of fleshy fruits, which are the true berries. An example of a true berry, things like grape is a true berry. Also, believe it or not, a banana. Bananas are actually berries. Yeah, bananas actually have seeds on the inside of them. If you take a banana and you split it open and then look on the inside, see the little dark things right there near the center? Those are the seeds of the banana. So you can actually open those up. And that, of course, leads us back to 
our tomato. The tomato itself is actually a berry, which means that it's a fruit. Now, is that what uh, Justice Gray decided? Was that this was a fruit? Well, interestingly enough, he did. He said uh, that this, by definition, was the result of a pollinated flower. That's what science teaches us. It's the result of a pollinated flower that has seeds on the inside, and therefore, by definition, it's a fruit. Problem. The whole reason the court case came up to the Supreme Court was that the people that were importing tomatoes into the United States in the late 1800s did not want to pay the tariff, the import tax on this. And there was import taxes on vegetables, not on fruits. So they were arguing it's actually a fruit and I don't have to pay taxes on it. Well, Go figure. Justice Gray, what he decided was, yes, technically by scientific definition, it is a fruit, but for the purpose of consumption and importation, we're going to go ahead and call it a vegetable. There's the best non-answer you've ever gotten. Go figure. A government official that acknowledges the truth, but then makes a different decision based on money. Some things just never change. <laughs> So there you have it. A tomato is a fruit. By definition, no two ways around it, that's what it is. So to borrow from a phrase, knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit, understanding is knowing why a tomato is a fruit, and wisdom is knowing not to put it in your fruit salad. Words to live by.